Greetings, I'm Dr. Dan Fortenbacher, founder of Wild Vision Therapy, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth episode in our series of the Luminary Program brought to you by Wild Vision Therapy, dedicated to advancing awareness and understanding of developmental vision and neurooptometric vision rehabilitation. In this episode, we'll be presenting on the topic of amblyopia effectively treating lazy eye at any age. Presenting with me today is Dr. Alyssa Pars, our Grand Rapids partner and clinic director, and Dr. Alicia Boltzma, our St. Joseph clinic director. So the topic amblyopia has many layers to it, doesn't it? The common term lazy eye is something that most people have heard of and either have experienced it themselves, the difficulty living with this condition, or know somebody who has had this and have had to wear an eye patch. So this is an interesting topic from a lot of layers. One is the patients who've experienced this and the other is looking at advancements in the treatment that go way beyond eye patching. Another interesting aspect is the outdated notion that treatment only works up to age 10. So we're gonna begin this episode with a brief overview of the condition, followed by our discussion and patient case examples. But before we get started, doctors, what are your thoughts on the topic of amblyopia? Thanks, Dr. Dan. Um, I definitely think amblyopia is a topic that is very, very interesting and something that there's a lot more to it than, you know, what I think on the surface people think, which is just eyesight. And there's so many other aspects to it that we address, you know, depth perception, eye teaming, focusing system, visual processing, and all of those other components, you know, are really equally important in treating the whole case. So I think really understanding all the aspects that can be affected when you have amblyopia is really important. Very good. I forget everything that you said there, Dr. Alyssa, that there's more to it than just the acuity, but I also think it's important um, to make sure that we are finding these kids and even the adults so that letting them know there is effective treatment beyond just improving how they see, but in their quality of life and different aspects as well that they don't even know they're missing. Yeah, very good point. So with that being said, how about we get started? So I'm going to share my screen right now, and I'm just going to give an overview here and get the ball rolling. So amblyopia, effective treatment for lazy eye at any age. Um, let's first of all consider the fact that next to refractive error, you know, the reason why most people need glasses, be it nearsightedness, farsightedness, or astigmatism, amblyopia is the most common form of vision loss in individuals. As a matter of fact, the prevalence of this is two to 4% of the population or approximately one in 30 individuals. So that means it's about 7.5 to 14.4 million individuals in just the United States alone. So let's break it down. When does this occur? Well, if we look at a definition, amblyopia begins in infancy and early toddlerhood. It's defined as a neurodevelopmental anomaly causes, it's caused by, and it causes changes in the neural software of the visual pathway. So we don't come into this world with good eyesight, normal visual function. It's something that's developed. So that's what's meant as a neurodevelopmental anomaly. And the result of it is that you typically see reduced visual acuity in one eye. Now it is possible to have this in both eyes, but that's less common. The question might be, why does this even happen? What is the cause of this? And with few exceptions, amblyopia is due to a dysfunction of binocular visual development, binocular visual development. We've got two eyes and they have to work together. So most commonly, the causes of this are a crossing or eye wandering known as strabismus. It's an eye teaming failure, binocular teaming failure or an unequal refractive error. And the technical term for that is anisometropia, unequal refractive status. And it can also be a combination of the two. Other less common causes are bilateral amblyopia. And this is due to when an individual child has a very high uncorrected refractive error at that infancy and toddlerhood stage. And you can end up with reduced visual acuity due to that condition as well as congenital cataracts and other rare forms of deprivation. So the prevalence of this is most common. The refractive anisometropia is about 50% of the amblyopes. 
strabismic about 19% and a combination 27% and the deprivation form is only about 4%. So amblyopia based on one of the key definitions that everybody tends to rely on is visual acuity or eyesight of the affected eye. And so looking at one of the examples of a definition based on acuity, mild would be that 20-25 to 20-40 visual acuity. Now 20-20 is the standard, which means at a distance of 20 feet, you see what you should be able to see at 20 feet. 20-25 is to 20-40 is mild, moderate, 20-50 to 20-80 in the affected eye and severe worse than 20-100. Now to be clear, this is with best correction. But when we look at the other aspects of this, in addition to reduced visual acuity in one eye, those with amblyopia also suffer from a significant effect on their depth perception. It's sometimes a complete loss of their stereo acuity, and that's the term for depth perception. So why? Why does this happen? Why is there a lack of depth perception? Well, it's not because of a loss of monocular visual acuity. The reason is because of a condition known as suppression. Suppression is the key component of amblyopia, and it's this presence of strong chronic suppression in the amblyopic eye that is ultimately the cause. And what does that mean? It means that the visual system shuts off the signal from the affected eye, and therefore the visual development ceases to occur beyond that. So that suppression zone can be significant. It has been implicated as the most important characteristic and cause of amblyopia. So if, you fur if we further look into this, and this suppression component of it, research has been done, and one example of this was published in the Journal of Investigative Ophthalmology and Vision Science, where they looked at one category, this being the eye movements for business amblyopia category in neuroophthalmology, where they analyzed what are some of the other aspects of amblyopia in addition to reduced visual acuity. So they looked at the perceptual process and other components of this, and what did they find? What they found was there is a physiological alteration in the visual pathways, and it affects many different things. It affects vision and motor, eye-hand coordination. It affects oculomotor or um, eye movement control and tracking, and it affects visual processing, making sense of what you see. It's not just you don't see clearly, it's making sense interpreting it. And the big one, of course, is it's a failure of depth perception or stereo acuity. In conclusion, the amblyopic individual's visual system is functionally monocular. It's due to the suppression during normal binocular viewing. However, binocular neural software within the amblyopic brain is structurally intact. It's just not turned on. So another aspect you might consider is, well, what do those with amblyopia feel about having lazy eye. And findings from a qualitative study was published in 2021 in the Journal of the OPO on does non-strabismic amblyopia, again, the most common form, affect the quality of life in adults? Again, let's take a look at how adults who've lived with this feel about it. And they did a, the findings from, they published the findings from a qualitative study on this. And what they found was in six different categories, first of all, symptoms, that they have individuals with amblyopia, refractive amblyopia, have consistent trouble with watery eyes, eye strain, headaches, uh, sensitivity and glare with, with lights. Additional symptoms reported were, of course, difficulty judging distances and also difficulty concentrating while reading, some sleepiness and dizziness associated with near work. From the emotional standpoint, there's concerns and apprehensions, doubts and concerns. When diagnosed at an older age, it's kind of like a shock. Why, why didn't I hear about this before? And they didn't know how other people with amblyopia see, and hence they weren't even aware what they were missing. They're also worried about further visual deterioration and certainly wish they had heard about this from their eye care providers when they were younger. There's another emotional part to this that comes out, which is a sense of guilt that when treatment was prescribed when they were younger, that they really didn't follow through with. And that's one of the common issues with the more traditional model is that it's got very low compliance. There's also a social stigma, reluctant to tell others, and just in essence, they don't like to wear their glasses because it doesn't oftentimes make a big difference. And there's also can be a cosmetic difference between the way those lenses look in the two eyes. So 
there's that component. Um, another thing has to do with activity limitations. No surprise when you have depth perception problems, it can be a problem for your driving. And this can be especially in a visual and a very busy area like in a parking lot, but certainly a concern when you're on the highway. So noting difficulty in precisely judging, distances between other cars, again, the excessive glare at night from headlights. Um, there can be also difficulty with obstacle loaded environments, just walking about difficulty with stairways, steps, negotiating those obstacles, and just poor judgment of depth. But also there's an interesting aspect of those with amblyopia is that they have difficulty with that peripheral vision in the amblyopic eye. It's almost like there's a, a tunnel-like uh, vision with that. And it's a common theme that we see with our patients. It affects their reading, they have eye strain and headaches while reading, and other symptoms that relate to this, uh, pursuing hobbies as well. There's hassles and inconveniences, coping with the symptoms. They tend to close one eye in response to bright lights, have to take frequent breaks. So you got this, this component of it. And finally, it can also affect a sense of their potential and their uh, career. Uh, we see this all the time with individuals who come to this who are uh, in a disappointment phase because they couldn't pursue what they wanted to do, whether it be the police, army, or certainly we've worked with a lot of pilots the good news, there is help for them, So, but they have oftentimes felt this disappointment. College students with amblyopia also tend to be worried about their eye condition impacting their future job and environment and computer usage at school and at work. So again, this came out of that paper, and, and, yet, and we concur, it's something that we commonly see. Correct, doctors? Would you say this is a common theme? Absolutely. So yeah, just definitely. more than just you can't see the letters or you know, the eye chart with one eye, it affects you in uh, many areas in your quality of life. So what about treatment? Well, we have a child here with an eye patch because this is the most common form of treatment that people are aware of. It's called occlusion therapy. So the basic treatment paradigm in children under age 10 is prescribe glasses for the full correction, wait a couple months, see if it helped, and then if it persists, which it typically does, begin occlusion or patching. And this occlusion therapy dosing can be full-time, all their waking hours, or part-time, and then monitor it uh, as, as, it, as the patient goes along. The methods are most commonly direct occlusion, which is just wearing an eye patch, and there's some examples of young children there variety of eye patch examples. There's also a technique called partial occlusion where the patient can have an optical defocus where the lens in the uh, fellow eye, the good eye, is made blurry so that the amblyopic eye has to force to see in itself while the other eye has got a blurry lens. Another example of that is called graded occlusion where it's intentional kind of translucent occlusion, translucent foil. And then the last one, which is also a very common one, is called medicated occlusion or pharmacological occlusion, where a, a drop called atropine is used on the fellow eye, the good eye, which basically paralyzes the focusing system, focusing uh, component of that eye. It dilates the pupil and also makes it so that the individual can't focus through it. So it kind of forces them to be patched because there's no escaping that, but also has side effects to it as well. The limitations to patching are acuity, while it does improve somewhat, typically regresses when the patching is discontinued. And again, this is based on the research. Recognize another limitation is that it doesn't do anything for the suppression. The patient still is stereo deficient by a patching an eye doesn't spontaneously turn on both eyes. In, in essence, you're reinforcing that. Other factors that go along with this are the um, psychosocial aspects. When a child is wearing a patch, they tend to be bullied and teased. Uh, they have frustration and anger. Uh, general, just they're unhappy about it. It affects them in a lot of ways. It's certainly playing sports or riding a bike uh, uh, and other things. So difficulty in function. And, and it's not a good idea to send a child with this into the classroom for obvious reason, but sometimes we've come across cases where that has occurred. So why? Why is occlusion the prescribed treatment plan when it has relatively poor outcomes, compliance is poor, and there's a significant fact, risk factors for side effects. Is there a better approach? 
And of course, since amblyopia begins with binocular dysfunction, binocular vision dysfunction, yes, effective treatment begins with correcting the cause. And that's what we're going to be talking about here is binocular vision, including stereoacuity, can be developed and at any age. So it's not age dependent. The critical period, of course, is true. There is a period of time where this develops, which is that, oh, typically uh, infancy up to maybe as far as six years, six to eight years of age is a critical period. But is there a critical period for vision rehabilitation? And of course, the answer is no. Pretty much anybody at any age can develop these abilities if they have the ability to interact in treatment. So. That's what we're going to be talking about here, and it's based on research as well. So we have uh, two of the most notable uh, scientists and uh, clinicians in this area, Dr. Robert Hess and Dr. Dennis Levi, who have studied researching the plasticity in the adult human brain. Uh, Dr. Hess is quite a notable researcher. He's actually published 433 papers. I just looked this up last night. He's Every year he's putting something out there. It's amazing how much uh, he's done in terms of this category. And so what he's determined is, in his research, that binocular function can be restored in adults with amblyopia. So this is telling us that binocular visual system also retains a considerable degree of plasticity. So plasticity even in adulthood. In Dr. Levi's uh, research, and there was a, a very impressive apprentice award lecture he delivered in 2011, talking about removing the breaks on plasticity in the amblyopic brain, he found that in both, even animals and humans, there's sufficient evidence to show that there's neuroplasticity beyond this initial critical period. Again, for the treatment side of it. The results of his research show that perceptual learning, which is kind of the uh, buzzword he uses for the aspect of treatment that we're gonna be talking about, targeted with visual video game play in visual acuity, and stereopsis can definitely be improved. And one of the things that he came uh, out with was gaming using um, a video game many years ago called Medal of Honor. But that's transitioned now to what we are using the more modern advancements in video game play in vision therapy is virtual reality in vision therapy. As a matter of fact, Dr. Pars and I, as well as Dr. Tuan Tran and Dr. Brian Dornbos, published a chapter in Advances in Ophthalmology in 2011 with the topic of vision therapy and virtual reality applications. So if you would like to check out more information on that, that is available to uh, obtain. But what does our office do with every patient with amblyopia? It starts with, first of all, we wanna understand them. We wanna understand how this is affecting them, whether it be a child or adult, what are the symptoms, what are the concerns, apprehensions, What's this having an effect on their emotions and their overall ability to do the things that they're trying to do? We're also looking at some of the fundamentals. I mean, we look at, of course, the standard visual acuity, but we look at it in a single row presentation, single letter presentation. So we are looking at that and we do a refraction with determining the proper ophthalmic RX. Binocular vision assessment is key to this. We certainly rule out any problem with strabismus or determine if there is a problem with strabismus. And a variety of tests that are used for that. We look at the sensory component of this. There's a terminology that's called sensory fusion. There's a first degree simultaneous perception, a second degree, which has to do with being able to put the two eyes together and see it together. And then the third degree is stereopsis. I see that in the slide, it's some of that's dropped off at the bottom. But 3D or stereo acuity is the third level of sensory fusion. We also monitor when our patients are in treatment, we monitor their progress in those three categories every week, their visual acuity, their suppression zone, we wanna shrink that suppression zone so it is gone, and then measuring their depth perception at distance and near. The application of lenses is also very important for many of our patients, the majority of them, and that is how do you prescribe it so you get maximum depth perception and so there is not only a science, but there's an art to prescribing lenses to maximize that stereo acuity. The point is you want the brain firing in all cylinders and having that stereo acuity working all the time. If you can facilitate that with your lens application, that's a big piece of the puzzle.
For some of our patients, because of this big difference in prescription between the two eyes, a contact lens on one eye or both, but a contact lens can neutralize the magnification effect that can occur when only glasses are prescribed. So contact lenses and sometimes combining them with spectacles are the way to go. There's even a, a lens called the Shaw lens that in, eliminates that difference in magnification. It's called anisochronic influence where the lens itself by spectacles can introduce a magnification effect or minification. And by having this particular design can help reduce or eliminate that. So giving patient choices is a very important piece to this. Uh, doing nothing is a choice, but you have to let the patient know there are things that can be done and let them decide. There's things that we have that we can help our patients with, whether it be home therapy, where they're working individually with us, working with them in a teletherapy model, where they're doing their activities at home. And 300 minutes a week is the appropriate duration of activities they need to do based on the research. Uh, we also interact with them once a week for 45 minutes in a Zoom teletherapy session. So home teletherapy is one option. Another one is combining the, the home teletherapy with in-office. We call that a hybrid combination. And so between those two, between the home and the hybrid, that tends to be for a kind of patient that is more less complicated. It is one that they can do more of these things independently. But for our patients that do have strabismus or more complicating factors, it's really important that, they, that we work with them in the office as well as have that home support. So in essence, we're looking at what are the ways, there's multiple ways to help our patients improve in their visual function. And it doesn't require wearing an eye patch. And that's one of the key things to understand. So why using both eyes together is better than looking with one eye alone? Well, gaining normal binocular vision can make a huge difference in the person's visual world. They just see things with a whole better perspective. Improved binocular vision reduces the stress and headaches. We see patients feel like they can read faster and easier. They are doing better and we're monitoring that. And it also improves their eye-hand coordination for driving sports and other day-to-day -day activities. So really when you look at the process that we're working on. We're working on developing binocular vision so that they attain not only visual processing, eye movement control, eye hand coordination, but that depth reception. That's really the glue that maintains that visual acuity. As the visual acuity improves, even in adult patients, it stays that way when both eyes are working together with normal depth reception. So in essence, better binocular vision provides a better quality of life. So with that being said, let's let's talk about some patient examples. Um, Dr. Uh, Alicia, why don't you start us off? Yeah, so uh, thank you for all that great information, Dr. Dan. That was helpful, and it ties into the first patient that I want to talk about. As you were going through your list, I was like, yep, 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 and corresponded with everything this patient was feeling. So we had a 37-year-old, and she was a general surgeon. She saw her primary care eye doctor and decided she was ready to do something about her decreased vision. And by the way, she was also a strab. So that adds into the complexity of her case. So she was a 25 left XT at both distance and near, but also had the refractive component with her amblyopia. So her right eye was plano and her left eye was a plus 375 with 125 still. So she's yeah. a combo is what you're saying. She had both yeah. the strabismus, the eye turning out, and the NISO, the refractive component. Yeah. So yeah. her acuity when she came in was 2070, which puts her in that moderate category of amblyopia. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, her provider was one who does shell lenses. So she actually came to us in a shell lens, which was really helpful um, because that allowed us to kind of jump right into the treatment aspect of things. Um, she had zero depth perception, as you can imagine, with both that strabismic component as well as the amblyopia. And on a word four dot, she was suppressing at greater than four feet. Um, and beyond, beyond that, she had some intermittent diplopia and all sorts of things going on, um, creating some of that factors. So with this patient, we decided that in-office was going to be best because of that factor of the strabismus with the refractive component. Um, and so we worked with her for about 50 sessions, I believe, and um, 
some of the things came slowly for her as we were going along. But some of the cool things were little things that she noticed in her day-to-day life. So as a surgeon, she mentioned as we were going through treatment that, oh, yeah, I used to have a lot of trouble threading my needle when I had to do stitches. Mm. And now that's not a problem. So there's that depth perception component that she was missing all along. She also mentioned that she would often miss, if somebody would hand her a tool on her left side, her amblyopic side, she didn't know exactly where it was and couldn't see it. But as we were treating that and reducing that suppression, we opened up that periphery on her left that side. That periphery opens she, up then. Yeah, she said, I had no no problem. I didn't have to yell at anybody for handing me tools on my left side anymore. Um, so she had some really great results as we finished therapy with her. Um, and her VA actually improved to 2040. So we didn't get the perfect 2020 acuity, but the improvements that she noticed, she said, I feel like I'm seeing so much clearer. The depth is there, which we saw in evidence that near she had 40 seconds of depth. And at distance, she kind of varied a little bit between um, getting 100% and 75% of that stereo. So a little bit of um, waffliness on our testing, but in her real life, she was so happy with all the improvements that she had made. And she was really glad that even as an adult, 37 years old, to find something that could really help her in her day-to-day life and the things that she didn't even necessarily know she was struggling with until she realized the change that it could make with the improvement in her stereo and her acuity. And I'm, I'm sure her patients would appreciate the fact that she now has depth perception when she's doing her procedures. So absolutely, of course, nobody knew that, of course, but at the same <laughs> time, she felt that confidence in working with her patients too. So that's yeah. great. And that's, that's a really interesting point that, um, you know, you talk about 2040 wasn't quite to 2020, but that's for a lot of patients when they are in that moderate or severe, it's not that they have to get to 2020, because when they're using both eyes together, they're not noticing even that much of an issue between 2020 and 2040 when they get to that point. But what really becomes more dramatic to them is that depth perception, peripheral opening up, and just overall visual functioning. Yeah. And I think that's what she was describing to us. So good one, good one. Dr. Alyssa, what, what's your example? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Alicia. That was an awesome case. It was cool to hear, a, you know, a case where it was an adult that really saw these big changes in her everyday life. So that was a really neat case. Um, the case that I'm going to be talking about is a younger patient. This is an eight-year-old little girl that came to see us. Um, and in this case, she had been wearing glasses since she was two years old, um, but no patching or no history of an eye turn. And she was actually referred by a neuropsychologist that um, she had seen recently because she had been struggling in school. Um, so she actually had the diagnosis of amblyopia prior to coming to see us. She'd been in glasses, as I said, for a while. And really the why behind she was coming to see us now was because of the struggle she was having in school. So, you know, reading being really challenging for her, her neuropsych had already diagnosed her with ADD as well as dyslexia. Um, and something that really stuck out to me is her performance in school and extracurriculars was hugely impacted by low confidence. And that confidence was really, really huge to see not only where she started, but also how that changed by developing her visual system. Um, so some of the statistics with her, she was actually a severe amblyope, um, a bilateral case. Hmm. Um, right eye was 2150 when she started, left eye was 2030. Um, she was a little bit in ISO, which is why she uh, had a much lower acuity in the right eye versus the left, um, a pretty high astigmatism in both eyes. And then she also had um, convergence insufficiency. Her near point of convergence was 12 inches, where she saw double, and 14 inches to recover there. She had no distant stereopsis, a little bit at near, about 400 seconds, and suppressed her right eye beyond four feet. Um, so definitely a little bit complex in the things that we wanted to work on, but even bigger impact were the changes we saw in her visual processing skills. So she was eight years old and pretty much across the board was scoring at a less than four-year-old age equivalent on all of our areas of visual processing. So her memory skills, her discrimination, her reversals and tracking were all very, very low when she started with us. Um, she did 
awesome Envision therapy. She did a total of about 35 sessions of completely office-based therapy. They lived locally, so luckily we were able to see her in office for all of her treatment. Um, it was another case where in the end, we, her eyesight was not 20-20, but hugely improved. So she went from 2150 in the right eye to 2050, um, and then left eye 2025, and actually could get a couple on the 2020 line um, there. Her near point of convergence was to the nose. Excellent depth perception, 120 seconds in the distance and 25 seconds at near. And all of her visual processing skills now at or above her age level. And how that impacted her on the day to day is she now was doing excellent in school. She, her confidence had hugely increased. She was now above her age level on reading, um, on the reading tests that the school did and all of her standardized testing, which was huge for her. And she even became first chair in the orchestra because she played an instrument. Um, so, you know, this went way beyond just the decrease in her eyesight. It was the confidence factor affecting her learning, her extracurriculars now. And to see all of that change, you know, by stabilizing her visual system was just huge. So, again, going back to all about function for her. Yeah, and that's a really good example of the depth of what we're measuring when we're looking at particularly the children and the visual processing component of it. Uh, the neuropsych. A neuropsychologist who referred the child probably had done so because she was underperforming and saw the visual piece to it. And then, oh, by the way, she had amblyopia. That was under basically the foundational reason for that. Is that what I'm hearing? Yep, that's exactly. They didn't even know. They knew she wore glasses, but had no yeah. idea she was an amblyope, you know, prior to her coming here. And so mm -hmm. kind of uncovering all of that and putting together all these you know, separate pieces to this little girl's puzzle was so important because, you know, it had a much bigger story as to how we, you know, work to fix it because of that. Yeah. So we start off with a more of a complex patient, an adult with strabismus and refractive amblyopia. It took a, you know, a fair amount of time, 50 visits to do that. We're talking about this little girl who got through the process in 30, 35 sessions. 35. Yep. 35. Let's talk about more of our, our basic patients. So Dr. Uh, Alicia, tell, give us an example of maybe somebody who's more of a straightforward, could be a combination of hybrid or uh, teletherapy. Yeah, so the next patient I'm going to talk about was a seven-year-old boy. Um, and he came to our office in sort of an interesting situation. It was his third eye exam in the past three weeks. His dad um, was really on top of it and this kid had no symptoms. He was a refractive amblyope and didn't know anything different. He was doing relatively well. Um, he was homeschooled, doing well, keeping up with everything. But they took him for an eye exam and discovered amblyopia. And so dad was set out to find the best possible care for him. Um, and so we saw him, like I said, for his third eye exam. Um, and his refraction was uh, about a plus 75 on his right eye, and then it was the left eye that he scoped about plus 550 in that left eye, um, and his acuity when he came to us was 2080. Um, and so obviously there's a lot going on there. Now, he suppressed greater than 20 feet when we first saw him. He did not recognize any distant stereo at near. He was able to get the fly when we put the correction on him. Tell us uh, what the fly means. What do you mean by the fly? Yeah, so the stereo fly is our typical example of kind of that big, gross stereo. Um, and so it's at, I believe, around 3,600 arc seconds. And just having the patient notice that the fly's wings pop off of the page. Um, so you had a little bit of that basis there, but really not recognizing a whole lot of stereo. Um, one thing that we did in his situation was we did actually overplus his fellow eye. Um, and that kind of goes to what you were talking about just a little bit, Dr. Bornbacher, where um, when we put just a little bit of an additional plus over his right eye, blurring him out to about 2040, that equalized out that binocular kind of rivalry that was happening. And he was able to get some distant stereo with that. So that was the place that we started with him. Um, was a little bit of that overplus in the right eye. And I believe it was over summer, so we weren't concerned about having the perfect acuity in a school classroom and things like that. So it worked out really well. Um, they were very compliant patients. We ended up doing a hybrid approach with this family. They lived several hours away from our office. So we would do 
um, once a month they would come into the office and on the other three weeks of the month I met with them virtually. Um, and a lot of our therapy was done through virtual reality as well as other video game play and things like that. Dad really appreciated the fact that it made his job easy to tell his seven-year-old son to go play video games for his vision therapy homework. Made it made it pretty easy. They were excellent at getting their 300 minutes in a week and sometimes went above and beyond to 400 and 500 minutes a week because he was just having fun with all the tasks that he was doing. Um, and he had excellent outcomes. I believe I worked with him for three to four months. Um, and his VA actually improved to 2020. He was even getting some of the letters on the 2015 line, which was fantastic. He had no suppression and he was getting 100% of stereo and he was really proud of the fact that he was beating dad on all of our stereo tests. Um, he does not let dad live that one down. So um, it shows how, you know, even in some of the younger kids where maybe the compliance factor can be a little bit challenging, if you offer them something fun to do, you can get excellent outcomes. And it's something that this kid will continue to maintain for the rest of his life from a relatively short period of doing fun things. Well, that's a great example also of how we can work with a patient remotely, in some extent, we're working with them remotely. And then the other part is they're in the office and they were in another part of Michigan where it was just really too hard to get to us. So it just made it more convenient for them. We do that also with some patients who are within driving distance, within a close driving distance, I should say. But it's just, you know, based on a lot of things going on in their lives, it just sometimes it's easier to work with us in this format. So we basically have evolved into treatment modalities that allow our patients to get the care and get the results and tailor it to their needs. I think that's one of the things that is a, uh, an important aspect of working with our patients in general, but especially with this, this population that uh, involves also video game play. One of the things that mentioned with the, the VR that we're doing uh, is that they're connected to us. We're using the Vivid Vision uh, virtual reality platform, Vivid Vision. And so basically all the patient needs to have is, uh, now it used to say Oculus, this is actually an older model of, but it's MetaQuest. And so they have the headset and then all they need is Wi-Fi, and they can connect to our platform and we can actually interact with them and control the activities. Um, any thoughts on that aspect of it, Dr. Alicia? Yeah, I think it's, it's fun and exciting, um, especially in these patients where they maybe have never seen in true depth before. You put them in a video game where things are popping out at them and they're reaching and grabbing. It's fun to watch their excitement as they do these things. And I always tell the parents, your kid is having a lot of fun. They don't even realize how hard they're working. Um, and it, it, like I said, it really makes the job easy for the therapist as well as the parents to say, go do your vision therapy homework, go play some virtual reality game. Yeah, and that's true for our adults too. I mean, a lot of times I talk to parents or my adult patients, I should say, and that's vision therapy needs to be interesting no matter how old you are, whether you're 60 years old or six years old, uh, it can't be boring. And that's one of the problems that there's been with treatment for amblyopia in a, in a sense of even beyond patching where different applications have been tried. If it's um, boring, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard to comply. And that's where there's a certain amount of time they do have to dedicate to it. But if you keep it interesting, that really helps compliance. Well, very good. Um, any other thoughts before we wrap it up? I think the only thing I thought of um, just in our cases and things is also to keep in mind, especially the refractive amblyopes, you know, these patients don't know what they're missing out on. So, you know, like Dr. Alicia said, sometimes they come in with, you know, very low symptom profiles because how do they know what they're missing out on? They've never seen in 3D. They don't know what that should even be like. They've just learned, you know, how to accommodate and work extra, extra hard to do that. So it's just something to keep in mind. You may not hear symptoms right off the bat, but to be able to educate these patients, you know, even in primary care optometry and other, you know, specialty areas that, you know, let's identify this. And then there are things that we can do to just make things easier. So you don't have to work so hard. Excellent point. 
Well, I think that's a good way to finish it. I would say thank you very much, Dr. Pars, Dr. Boltzma, for being a part of this fourth episode of Luminary Program. And for you, the viewer, thank you very, very much for watching. Have a great day.